Autopine disease. DSE. DSE can find the cerebral vascular disease. And the last one is X-linked brain field, which is less used in clinic. So examination of intraclinic hypertension depends on LP, CT, and MR scan, and DSA. So this, this measured method can help us to find and to differentiate the diagnosis of the intraclinic hypertension. Another examination we most used in clinic is ICP, monitoring, monitoring, moni monitoring, ICP monitoring. Management of intracranial hypertension. If the patient have primary disorder, so we should remove the disorder as soon as possible by surgery or other clinical method. If the patient has infection, we should use agent to anti-infection, like antibiotics. If the patient has edema, we should use the medical to decrease the edema. Or other reason, we should surgery method or clinical agent to treatment of the intracranial hypertension. So this is the management of the intracranial hypertension. Management of intracranial hypertension, we talk about it here, include the intravenous agent. Intravenous agent include manitol. Manitol is most used in clinic to decrease the intraclinic hypertension. And uh, glycerin, flosimine, and albumin. <coughs> Another agent is oral agents, like uh, diclocizide, triamitalins, and uh, acetazolomamate. So this is oral agent. Oral agent is not no useful for management of intracranial hypertension. Right now we emphasize on manitol here. Manitol. Manitol has some function for intracranial hypertension. The first one is lowering ICP. Lowering ICP. How can manitol lowering ICP? The first reason is manitol can immediately plasma exchange, increase CBF and the oxygen delivery. The second reason is osmomatic effects. Increased serum tonicity draw edema flowed from cerebral Plankyma, plankyma. So the first function is lowering ICP for manitol. The second function is supports the microcirculation by improving blood rheology. So the second function is supports the microcirculation by improving blood rheology. The another function of manitol is that possible free radical scavenge, scavenge of free render, a radical. So this is the function of the manitals. Another agent is fluosimate. Fluosimate have loop acting uh, diuretic. Diuretic may reduce the ICP by reducing cerebral edema. Possibly by increasing the serum tonicity, and it may also slow the production of CSF. So this is a function of the fluosimate. Fluosimate also acted synergistically with 
medical. So in clinic, we use the medical and the glucemid sometimes together to treat the intracranial hypertension seen the James Decker. Another manage management like corticosteroid, corticosteroid reduced brain edema. Sometimes it's very useful. Hypothermia. Hypothermia can slow down brain metabolism. Pharmatolite. Pharmatolite sometimes we use to combine with hypothermia. Excessive ventilation. Excessive ventilation can cause cerebrovascular contraction, contraction, CBF contraction, and CB uh, cerebral blood vessel contraction cause the CBF decrease and uh, intracranial hypertension decrease. Antibiotics, antibiotics is used to control infection and other management like. Symptomatic treatment, like sedation, leukine, and so on. So this is many much of the intracranial hypertension. So right now we talk about the intracranial hypertension briefly. Right now we should talk about another topic. This topic is brain herniation. Brain herniation. Before we study herniation, we have to review some anatomy of the central nervous system. As we know, there are focus, focus cerebri, and cantorium cerebellar inside the cranial cavity. Focus cerebri and tentorial cerebellar divides the cranial cavity into several compartments like the supra tentorial compartment and infra tentorial compartment inside these different compartments there are different brain tissue so this is the infra, uh, infrastructure of the brain hernia so what's the definition of the brain herniation? When there is a significant assessment pressure increased within the cranial cavity, the brain structures should, would be forced to enter another compartment and the brain herniation will occur. So this is the definition of the brain herniation. Depending on the happening location of herniation, we can divide it to herniation into different herniation, like downward transtentorial herniation, upward transtentorial herniation, cerebellar tonsillar herniation, and the subforcing herniation. So these four kinds of herniation is depending on the happening location, happening location of herniation. Firstly, we talk about the downward trans herniation, which is one of the most common herniation we can see in clinic. <laughs> downward trans tentorial herniation results from an asymmetrical supratentorial mass, supratentorial mass, right here, which can produce a vector with both a medial, a medial and a inferiorly directed force. So this is a downward transitorial addition. The clinic of manifestation of transtontorial herniation. Usually, the clinical 
her mission is called Weber's syndrome. Weber's syndrome is characterized by hypersilateral pupil dilation and contralateral hemiplegia. So this is a Weber's syndrome. It most can we can find in the patient with a downward transitorial herniation. So what's the pulsar physiology of downward transitorial herniation? First, we can see what happened in brainstem. Brainstem will be distortion, displacement, ischemia, edema, hemorrhage, and so on, and so on. Because brain stem was is compressed by brain tissue after herniation. So this is the pathology, pathophysiology of brain stem. Another pathophysiology is cerebral blood. Cerebral, uh, cerebral spinal fluid will be obstructed by the herniation. And uh, the cerebral spinal fluid circulation will be disordered. And the other pathophysiology is blood vessel, like uh, main artery injury. The artery was compressed by the honey issue, so the main artery will be injury, and which results in brain tissue infarction. So this is the pathophysiology of transpentorial honey issue. Sometimes it's hard to understand. Right now we talk another honey issue, which also is most common in clinic. This herniation is cerebral, cerebellar tonsillar herniation. So what's the definition of cerebellar tonsillar herniation? Displacement of the cerebellar tonsils into the foramen, magnum, and compression of the medullary oblong data. So this is the definition of the cerebellar tonsillar herniation. So this condition we also call trans foramen magnum condition. So this is our another name. It's trans foramen magnum condition. What is the manifestation of cerebral tonsillar condition? The first manifestation is headache, headache, vomitus. These symptoms the most uh, we can find in the intracranial hypertension. And uh, another classic manifestation is neck rigidity, rigidity. In the little face of the cerebral tonsillar hernia, severe occur, severe headache occur, and uh, Breathing stop suddenly. Compared to another type of the herniation, cerebellar tonsillar herniation is characteristic by breathing stop suddenly. So this is the most uh, most uh, obvious symptom and sign in this herniation. Management of brain herniation. If there is original disease, we should remove the original disease as soon as possible to decrease the intracranial hypertension. And sometimes the condition will be disappear. External vertical drainage, EVD. EVD is most useful or most effective surgery method to to manage the condition because the CBS, the CSS drainage was drainage to outside of the body. So the intracranial pressure decreased suddenly, the condition will be disappeared. So EVD is the most effective surgery 
method to to treatment to treat the intracranial hypertension and uh, brain hypertension. And uh, another surgical method is cranial decompression. Cranial decompression. Cranial decompression is also very useful for for treatment of the intracranial hypertension or or herniation. This is all today. Thank you very much. <laughs>